one of the most important features of uh, feudal China is the occurrence of a series of uninterrupted rebellions, peasant rebellions in all parts of the country. The fact is that no country other than China had a more continuous tradition of peasant rebellions. In fact, century after century, imperial China had been witness to the occurrence of rebellions, rebellions such as those led by the yellow turbans, bronze horses, red eyebrows, these secret societies. And in fact, apart from these, there are many other rebellions which took place over the years, over the centuries. And this tradition was a very rich one, uh, partly in the sense that such rebellions were more or less frequent, more or less uninterrupted, and partly because it remained very much alive in the minds of the peasants. And in fact, the peasant rebels always looked back to the past to draw sustenance from the rebellions which took place in the ancient period, which took place in the days of yore. The Taiping Rebellion was one such rebellion. It has been regarded as one of the greatest of the peasant rebellions in the history of modern China. The Taiping Rebellion took place at a time when the Manchu dynasty was in power. Manchus were regarded by the Chinese as foreigners. They overthrew the Ming dynasty and came to power. This rebellion was caused by a number of factors, but internal and external, both. Internally, what we find is that at the end of the 18th century, decline set in in the Manchu court or the Qing court, and signs of decadence at the center led to mismanagement in the provinces. Corruption and greed among officials were rampant, and official and everyone was looking for official posts, and official posts were sold out to the highest bidder. And the persons who could buy official posts, either with their own money, and if they did not have the money, they would have to borrow the money from some other source. And when they got the official posts, they could buy the official posts, they utilized those official posts to amass money, not only to pay off their debts, but also to amass more and more fortunes. So the taxes were doubled, tripled, uh, even more heavily increased, and the whole burden of this increase in taxes fell primarily upon the peasants and on the artisan population. As in all feudal societies, Chinese society was a feudal society, and as in all feudal societies, land was concentrated in the hands of a handful of gentry officials, who were also known as scholar gentry, and the peasants had been subjected to all forms of oppression and exploitation. These were the factors which caused peasant rebellions in the earlier period. But when we talk about the mid-19th century, that is the Taiping Rebellion, then it can be seen that there were some additional factors also which contributed to the occurrence of this great peasant rebellion. Now, one new element was the massive increase in population. Over one century, from 1751 to 1851, our population simply doubled, more than doubled, from 180 millions to 430 millions in one century. But the fact is that even though population increased to a very large extent, the area of cultivable land did not increase in the same proportion. There was also no industry to absorb the surplus population, and there was also no territory uh, to which they could, the surplus population could migrate and settle down. The only alternative left was further division and more intensive cultivation of the existing land. And the inevitable result was a further impoverishment of the already impoverished peasant masses and the lowering of their standard of living to a far greater extent. So that was one factor, population explosion. The second factor was the entry of Western capitalism, because we know that Taiping Rebellion took place in the context of Western capitalist encroachment into China. From the beginning of the 19th century, the import of goods started, particularly export of opium from India, from Asia Minor region started, and that increased considerably in proportion with exports. Thus, a balance of trade became unfavorable for China. 
China had to pay uh, more and more silver in order to buy opium, which was, of course, forced upon the Chinese population after the Opium War and the signing of the Treaty of Nanking in 1842. So there was an outflow of silver from China. Now, before the beginning of the 19th century, one ounce of silver, which was known as tail, T-A-E-L, tail, that was equal to 1,000 copper coins. But in 1835, the rate of exchange simply doubled. Now one ounce of silver became, was equal to 2,000 copper coins. That was the ratio. The problem was that the great majority of the Chinese people, they usually used copper coins in their day-to-day -day transactions in order to pay for goods. Uh, they received money in copper in lieu of their services. And all the day-to-day -day transactions were done in with copper as a medium of exchange. But now suddenly, as a result of this alteration in the rate of exchange, it simply doubled. Doubled. And the problem became problem was that uh, though they used copper coins in their day-to-day -day transactions as before, they had to pay their taxes not in copper but in silver. So for them, taxes simply doubled as a result of this change, alteration in the rate of exchange. And another factor that was China was visited by a series of natural disasters during 1826 to 18. 50. And it was these factors which created the material conditions for the revolutionary uprisings in, the, in many parts of the country. Uh, it is pertinent to point out in this connection that uh, the Taiping Rebellion took place in the time of the Opium Wars, an opening of China by the Western powers. And the political and social crisis was exacerbated by the First Opium War of 1840-42 and the signing of the first humiliating treaty, the Treaty of Nanking in 1842. It was from this period that feudal China got transformed into a semi-feudal and semi-colonial China. Before the Opium War, trade, foreign trade, was concentrated more or less within the port city of Canton. Canton was the only port which was officially opened to foreign trade and commerce. But after the Opium War, first Opium War, the signing of the Treaty of Nanking, there was the opening of new ports, Shanghai, Ningpo, uh, Fuchao, Amoy, apart from Canton. And the result was that after the signing of the Treaty of Nanking, Canton lost in importance because of the opening of new and newer ports as a result of Western encroachment and further encroachment, extraction of modern made privileges from China. Hundreds and thousands of people depended on the port city of Canton for their livelihood. There were porters, there were innkeepers, there were boatmen in large numbers. Now they suddenly found that they did not have any employment at all because of the decrease in the importance of Canton as a result of the opening of new ports in other areas. And it was this unemployed population, lakhs of people, millions of people, who swelled the typing ranks when the rebellion started. There were other factors as well. One was the influx of cheap foreign textiles, foreign textile goods, which are produced in large-scale factories in England or in other Western countries. They flooded China. And so millions of Chinese weavers or artisans of other types, they became ruined. It was a process which is known as the industrialization, uh, a feature which was very much evident also in India, in our country, as also in other countries uh, which were colonized or which were reduced to the state of semi-colonies as a result of the onrush of Western capitalism in some time or other. So we have also a large number of unemployed artisans as a result of influx of foreign textile goods in the Chinese market. And it was this, this huge body of unemployed artisans who, of course, joined the Taiping uh, rebel army. Besides these factors, 
nationalist elements also played an important role in it. It has been pointed out by Frank, W. Frank, in his book, The Century of the Chinese Revolution, that the followers of the Ming Dynasty, the dynasty which was overthrown by the Manchus in 1644, they prepared a literary battle against the Manchus, against the Qings, at the end of the 17th century. And there were a series of writings, Ming writings, directed against Manchu rule in China. And it was these writings which influenced the Taiping leaders, Taiping activists to a large extent. And it also influenced other, rising, other risings, Indian nationalist or proto-nationalist emphasis. And it was the supporters of the Ming dynasty again, who formed a secret society called the Heaven and Art Society, whose main slogan was overthrow the Qing and restore the Ming. So they, they were in favor of the restoration of the Ming rule. So these people were also there, the followers of the Ming dynasty. They, they joined the Taiping ranks because, or they uh, made their propaganda in a way that influenced the Taiping rebellion to a very large extent. Now the Taiping rebellion began in the province of Guangxi near the Vietnam border and they made Nanking their capital and set up their own revolutionary rebel state of the oppressed people which was also known as Taiping Tian Kuo or Heavenly Kingdom of the Great Peace. This rebel order had an existence from 1851 to 1864. It was led, among others, by Hung Siu Chuan. Hung Siu Chuan was a supreme leader of the Taiping. He was a poverty stricken school teacher uh, who was educated in Confucian learning. He was a scholar, educated person. Apart from the school teacher, who was the top leader, people from other walks of life also joined the Taiping Rebellion. And that explains its class basis, the class basis of the Taiping movement. They came from varied sections, such as charcoal burners, village school teacher, of course, Hong Siu Chuan himself was a village school teacher, poor peasant, woodcutter, trader, rich peasant, and others. And apart from these, there were uh, representatives uh, from the scholar gentry, scholar gentry, who opposed the Manchus, uh, not for social reasons, but for national reasons. They were anti-Manchu because they were pro-Ming. So it was not nothing social about it, but there was something national about it. And apart from this, a number of tribes, Chinese tribes, uh, minority tribes, minority nationalities like such as Hakka. Hakka tribe was one of the earliest to join the rebels. Hakka, Yao, Miao, these tribes are small nationalities, they uh, joined. And apart from them, we have the miners and former pirates. Pirates joined it because as a result of the entry of Western vessels, it was difficult for the pirates to carry on their piracy. So they were uh, they were wiped out in one sense. So, so they uh, swelled the typing ranks. Uh, and moreover, there were a few traders, some well-to-do peasants also. Uh, there were also deserters from the government army, imperial army, that is the Manchu army, and porters, of course, porters from Canton, boatmen from Canton, innkeepers from Canton, who did not have any employment at all. And of course, the peasantry constituted the overwhelming majority of uh, the rebels. The Taiping rebels quickly grew in strength. In the summer of 1852, they left their original base in Guangxi and marched northwards towards Hunan, where they were joined by a huge body of rebels from other movements. From Hunan, they proceeded through Hupei and then occupied Nanking, which was the southern capital of the Ming dynasty. They occupied Nanking in the spring of 1853 
and this Nanking became the seat of rebel capital. Hong Siuquan himself set up his court in Nanking. After that, an army was dispatched towards, towards the north with the aim of capturing Peking. Their military preparations were inadequate, and the southern soldiers were also unable to adjust to the rough northern cold climate. In south, we have a warm climate. In north, we have a cold climate. So they failed in their push towards the north, and this thrust towards the north was more or less futile. The rebels could not keep their revolutionary fervor intact for a long time uh, due to a number of reasons. They had suffered from several weaknesses also. One weakness was in fighting among themselves, which ultimately contributed to the death of some of the important leaders. It was this internal contradiction, let us say internal contradiction, which in 1856 brought the revolutionary offensive to an end and its continuance in the following years was only in the nature of defensive, not at all in the offensive lines. Certain other internal contradictions also developed within the rebel order. To start with, the rebels, they began by conducting mobile warfare. Guerrilla warfare, which undoubtedly was a people's war, and the people rose spontaneously against the feudal order. However, as the French historian Cheneau points out, after establishing a government and a state in Nanking, the leaders soon turned into a privileged class. That is, they became part of the privileged class against whom they had been fighting throughout this period. And in order to make the governmental machinery work, which, invo which involved imposition of taxes on the peasantry. They imposed taxes on the peasantry. And thus the peasants ceased to be a motive force of the movement. They became very, uh, uh, they, discontent grew up among the, among the peasantry. And they ceased to, became, became, to, be, to remain a motive force of the movement. And they became subjects of a government which they, at one point of time, considered their own. This was probably was the most important factor, which weakened the rebel state. The next factor was the attacks by foreign armies. Foreign troops militarily intervened, not initially, but at one point of time, at a later point of time, in defense of the Manchus, when it became clear that the typing measures were revolutionary in nature. It was not just anti-Manchu, but it had revolutionary orientation. Uh, these were the weaknesses, major weaknesses from which the Taiping rebels suffered. Now, one point should be mentioned here is that many progressive people in the Western world, they supported the Taiping rebellion and they raised their voice against Western interference. Many progressive people of those times. Uh, the foremost among them, of course, were Marx and Engels, they wrote a series of articles denouncing this aggression on China and a number of foreigners directly fought for the Taipings also. Uh, we have one British citizen, Augustus Linley, who not only took up arms on the side of the Taipings, but he also wrote a moving eyewitness account of the rising. It is available in the National Library, you can read it. There are also a number of former officials of the French army who joined. And there was at least one Italian, uh, Major Moreno by name, who played an active part in the Taiping Rebellion. He actively joined uh, the rebellion. The last phase of the battle was the bloodiest of all. Uh, the combined attacks of the Manchus and the foreign troops finally put an end to this great peasant rebellion in the history of modern China. And in the summer, it was in the summer of 1864 that capital Nanking fell to the Manchus and foreign powers. Why is it that there was a continuous tradition of peasant rebellions in China, even long before the 19th century and ones that even continued to the 20th century? Why particularly in China? China was a country which experienced uh, the feudal era uh, for the longest period of time. Uh, 
the feudal epoch started in China approximately from 6th century, 5th century BC. That is at least 1,000 years before it emerged in, in our country. 1,000 years, nearly 1,000 years before it emerged in Western Europe. So since China experienced a feudal period for the longest period of time, class contradictions, that is a contradiction between the peasants and the landlords, that was very sharp. These are very sharp in China. And that is the reason why one witnesses the occurrence of a series of peasant rebellions in all parts of China, uh, rebellions of, a low, of, of, of different uh, magnitude, uh, big rebellions, small rebellions, riots, uh, and other outbreaks, almost uninterrupted, long, long history of peasant rebellions. So China, that is, that is the heritage of China, the long history of peasant rebellions. So since it was feudal system was more deep rooted and more long lasting in China in such large numbers, which we cannot find in any other feudal uh, society of the world.